declared. But Noam, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself. Obviously, it was on the bio for the event, right? But it'd be great to just have a more current version of who you are. Yeah, um, I'm Noam. I am a director and producer, recently writer, too. Um, I've been doing documentary films for a while. Um, I'm a National Geographic Explorer, so I've done a lot of work with them um, and started out in the what's called like adventure media um, film industry, which is like outdoor sports or stories um, related to the outdoors. Um, and then recently have been doing more social issue documentaries and also some writing and narrative stuff coming soon. So um, looking to transition a bit to try some, some narrative films. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm excited to kind of at least see what you can discuss with us so far in a little bit. Yeah, but sure. I would love to just walk it back and um, we, what we like to do on these Ask an Expert segments is just have you tell us a little bit about what first inspired you to be a storyteller, if there's something that stood out to you from your past that you could share with us. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been, um, I've been thinking about this a lot because I, I just got done applying to, to um, MFA programs in grad school, so it's like the number one question. <laughs> So you've answered that quite a bit already. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, a lot of it comes to like something that was sort of innate for me from childhood a bit, you know, like I was really, I grew up in Orlando, so I was obsessed with Disney. Um, and I, I come from like a very poor immigrant family. So that was kind of like all I had growing up. Um, and I think a lot of my understanding of American culture, like a lot of immigrants came through like film. Um, movies, TV, and, and Disney in particular. So I think that was like always kind of there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't really until, I always kind of wanted to do something that made an impact. And I, I worked in DC for a bit um, in like the State Department and I did sort of a hodgepodge of things, but I think I realized the telling stories about issues to me makes more of an impact than um, you know, working in government, which can be slow and things like that, but I can always get my story out. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I know uh, the few times we talked, but it'd be great if you could share a little bit more here. You definitely are self-taught in a lot of ways. Like, obviously I know you've worked with great teams, but can you tell us a little bit about kind of, I know you coin yourself sometimes, like you definitely self-taught a lot and learned a lot along the way on your own. Yeah, I, a lot of people, um, like college students or high school students reach out to me, which is really fun. Um, and they're like, can I come intern for you? And I am like, well, you should make a movie by yourself first. So I think that was my big lesson. Like, I just started shooting by myself and the things I made were really terrible. But I think there's nothing like throwing yourself out there with your camera and then trying to edit it and directing it yourself and you can even just do it with your friends which is kind of what I did at first and I think a lot of people get their start that way but um yeah I think that's where that's where it came in and I'm still like self-teaching myself <laughs> self-teaching myself I'm still um you know as I transition into narrative I've been on like studio binder um if you guys know them yeah a lot watching youtube videos master class so like the internet's great. <laughs> Especially now when we have all this time to get yeah. into it. Yeah, but it's funny. I'm, I'm really vulnerable about the things I don't know, which I think has been really key. Like when I was first starting out um, and I, I like hired a DP that was way more experienced than I was. And I was just like, hey, I don't know anything about shooting, but I think I can tell this story. So let's, you know, whatever you can teach me would be great. And then I just send an email like that out to my current DP on my narrative film. And I, cause I, I did a shot list and she was like, this looks weird. And I was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but <laughs> so you tell me where I messed up. And you know, if, if you've got good collaborators, that vulnerability goes a long way. When you were first, you know, scrappily making films with friends or just on your own and kind of self-teaching the editing process, 
um, you know, around when did that start for you and when did that shift happen from when you were doing it because you really just enjoyed it to almost committing yourself to that craft as something more professional for you? Yeah, I think it was a, it was a very deliberate shift. I was working at a um, fitness app, a media fitness app at the time that did like digital fitness workouts that I was producing. And I think that reminded me that, hey, I can actually do this because I was really doing the whole, those, you know, it's kind of like, like the, now there's a bunch of those, like the Peloton app and whatever, but yeah. at the time there weren't as many. And so I realized I was really doing this myself and I was like, oh, I could actually, I have these skills. I could, if I can do it for this company, I could probably do it for my own film. Um, and so I decided to apply for the National Geographic Explorer grant to do a film. And I told myself that if I got it, I would quit my job and just do that. Um, but of course I couldn't wait. So I quit my job before I actually got it. <laughs> and, uh, and luckily I got it. <laughs> so yeah, it worked out great. for you, clearly. And I had gotten so far down the rabbit hole that I think, I think it just takes like one project where you realize I have to be on this a hundred percent or it's not going to happen. Um, cause filmmaking is so hard and there's so many barriers. So I think I finally, when I realized that I was all in on this one project, I just said, okay, I think, you know, if I'm not going to commit a hundred percent to it, it's just not going to happen. Um, and so that was, it was a very active shift and I opened my production company and I like, got a lawyer and incorporated everything. So it was, it was very, I was like, I'm going for it. Let's do this. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious too, when you did make that shift, did you want to, like, did you choose to kind of do some more action oriented films or I think you said adventure film or outdoor space films? Like, was that deliberate as well? Or did that kind of just naturally, those were kind of the things you just started doing? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I've been a climber for a long time, and I was a mountaineer for a while, and a skier, and so I was very enmeshed in that community, and it just seemed really like an easy barrier because, or sorry, like a low barrier to entry, like an easy thing to get into, because you're already going on these trips, and you actually do know the professional athletes, because it's a small community, and everyone knows everyone, and you know, you're out there in Yosemite, or in Alaska, and you're you're already interacting with these people. So I think for a lot of us in the community who are filmmakers, um, we just said, oh, well, we could just shoot it, you know, um, if we knew how. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think I also, I had a lot of contacts in that scene and started connecting to North Face and National Geographic. And, you know, it's, it's a really small community. So once you know a few people, you kind of know everyone. Um, but it just it just seemed like the easiest thing to do. And that's kind of what I tell people usually who want to get into filmmaking period, you know, just, just pick the easiest thing that you have access to that also um, has interesting stories around it. And I think the adventure, I, what I like about like the outdoor or out, extreme sport community is like the people there are crazy, right? You know, they're doing these insane things that not only people want to watch, but the psychology behind it is ridiculous. Um, so I think, yeah, it was definitely a conscious choice because it was just the easiest thing. But I think I always had the end game of doing more social issue documentaries okay. and things like that. Yeah. Before I kind of transition to that aspect, I'm curious, and you've touched on this before in a couple of our conversations, but the outdoor adventure filmmaking space is pretty predominantly male, correct? I mean, what is that like for you coming in there? And I know that you love working with female colleagues as well. What has that experience been like for you coming into a space that does have a lot of both male athletes and male filmmakers documenting it? Yeah, I mean, there's there's been some difficulty for sure. Um, you know, it's especially in outdoor films, you know, I think it's just, a lot of men have male climbing partners or whatever, and they go on these trips with other men. So it could seem strange for a woman to come in and start telling people what to do. And it sort of disrupts the like bro club. Um, and I'm not hating on that. It's just like, there's a group, you know, it's like if there was a guy who came in on your girls night and was like, I want to film you. And you were like, what? <laughs> So it, it, it's a bit of that, It was, or it was a bit of that in the beginning. Um, 
which I think is why I sort of started doing a bit of different kinds of stories, more cultural stories or more female driven stories or stories about fatherhood where the athlete actually felt better opening up to me than to a man. Um, so I think I've sort of maneuvered my way into the scene because I have different stories that I'm interested in beyond um, like the standard, we're on a trip, let's, let's film it. You know, we have an objective, we're gonna sum it. So my stories are more nuanced because I might not get access to those things, but I get access to other things. So um, that's sort of been my approach, but I also have had, I've said this before, but I've had really, I've been lucky to have really, really great um, sensitive male collaborators. Um, I think it's just about pitch, picking a story that the subject feels they can trust you and connect with you as well. And you're not like interrupting the bros, like summiting or something. <laughs> it is interesting though, because now that I think about it a lot, you know, maybe not recently, but when I first started looking out for adventure types of documentaries, it is very mission driven. Like we are here on this trip to achieve this goal. And it's a, like a very simplistic storytelling. You know what I mean? Like it's not very nuanced, like you said, or complex. It's like, we're yeah. here to document this trip as they hike this mountain. And that's the story. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've try, I'm trying, me and, um, so, uh, honestly, it's a lot of women, I think, because maybe if we go on objective driven trips, it's with other women, um, or we're like the climbing partner of a man sometimes. Um, or I don't know, there are mission driven women's stories out there in the adventure filmmaking world a lot. But I think a lot of the directors actually are female directors are telling these more nuanced stories about fear or body image or um, like balance and sort of more like philosophical character driven human stories that are more similar um, to like uh, traditional filmmaking and less like get to the summit, come back. Right. Like, I, I see there's another filmmaker that's watching, Sarah Moshman, who did the documentary Losing Sight of Shore. And even that film, which of course there was an end goal, it was so complex and even just like individual characters. So I do see that what you're saying. Like, I mean, that's great that women are the ones that are definitely leading that charge. <laughs> but um, it is, it is, like you said, it is great when even if there is a mission, at least highlight the complexities of the human spirit you know what I mean it's not just them like hiking all day you know like like you said there's a lot of internal struggle that happens and you highlighted that in your film with the gentleman who had just had his baby right and was just really can you tell us a little bit about that film and that moment that you captured which was so beautiful I did not do a good job setting it up but I would yes. love to get introduced um also Sarah and I have talked before so hi Sarah um <laughs> uh but um yeah the that film was a disaster, um, honestly, because, and a really fulfilling disaster that ended up being really amazing, but I was basically a gun for hire director, um, hired on by Merrill to do this shoot, and it was supposed to be an objective film, a mission-driven film. Um, and I, I honestly think like some of the best ones are the ones where people fail because they're more complicated, and it's hard to tell a very interesting story when it's like, we tried, we succeeded, we came back, hooray, you know, it's like, wow. Uh, yeah. um, but the, <laughs> this one just had so many barriers. Like we realized we couldn't shoot in the national park because you can't do commercial. Oh, okay, because you're with Merrill, in yeah. Alaska, which we did, yeah, there was like this whole thing. So we were like, wow, we can't actually shoot on the mountain. So that was like one thing. So we were like, how are we gonna shoot him summiting? <laughs> And then actually his partner ended up, so then we set up this whole thing where they were gonna do GoPros and we were gonna Im incorporate it in and we had this whole plan. And mind you, this is all happening like in Alaska, like, you know, cause we had this like three day shoot where we shot with um, the family in Colorado and then we flew to Alaska and then we found out all these things. So it was a lot of moving pieces and having to change the story arc and the, the shooting style and the strategy. Um, and then his partner had an accident while on one of their training days. Wow. Um, and because of that accident, he decided it was too risky to do it by himself. He was, sorry, I didn't even explain what this movie was. <laughs> um, my bad. Basically, this, this uh, professional athlete was going for the fastest known time 
um, for summiting Denali. So we were in Denali National Park shooting um, and he was trying to summit Denali, which is the tallest mountain in North America in the fastest time. So it's like, it's one of the hardest mountains. It's super treacherous. Some people say it's harder than Everest in terms wow. of technicality. Um, but that's actually true. It is harder than Everest, I would say, in terms of the actual skill. And then they were going to ski down and it was him and this partner. But his whole thing was he didn't want to do it without a partner. And, okay. and the partner got injured. And so he decided not to do it. So suddenly all we had was a bunch of footage in Boulder, Colorado, some footage in Alaska, no footage on the mountain that we could legally use, and no <laughs> summit. <laughs> so we were like, oh my God. <laughs> what ended up happening with this film, this project? We'll have to see the film. <laughs> um, no, I can, I can tell, I can tell a bit, obviously. But um, so what I ended up deciding was we really dug deep into the psychology of Mike, the athlete, and why he didn't want to summit alone. Um, and it was because he had just had a baby and he didn't want to die. And that's really amazing. And we were sort of coming off the heels of Free Solo, which was an incredible film, but definitely one of the messages in Free Solo was everything for the objective, everything for the mission. You know, it's, it's a character piece about this single driven person who is willing to sacrifice it all for the goal and Mike was really different than that you know Mike yeah. was not willing to sacrifice it all for the goal he didn't care that there was brand sponsors and cameras and whatever he was like screw all you guys I'm going home to my kid um which I think is a really cool thing for a father to say um so we ended up kind of shifting the film to be about that and his son um, and we added in a lot of animation and did a bit of things from the sun's perspective and kind of wove in all this POV stuff. So and it is, it's really beautiful how it came together. But I was, uh, yeah, shitting my pants. Yeah, I was going to go back. That is a lot. That's not just a casual, like, technical issue where, like, oh, okay, we have to just change location. This is, I mean, the entire film basically was stop. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you just yeah. redirect the entire narrative on location. That's yeah, bad. and in the edit, honestly. Um, wow. So yeah, that was a tough one, and we had to go back and get more interviews and stuff. But it, it ended up working out okay. I'm really happy with how it came out, and people really liked it. But yeah, gotta stay on your toes. So even even when I'm handed an objective film, I don't make an objective film. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody had a question about this exact film a little bit and your partnership with Meryl. But it says, can you speak to how it is that Meryl commissioned you to make the film? Like, if you could go into that a little. Sure. So um, basically, I have relationships with a few production companies that sort of function like agencies, if you've heard of like, um, yeah, just basically what happens is brands hire com production companies to make films for them or agencies to make commercials for them. And those companies or agencies hire us. Um, so I just have relationships with different production companies and it, they're their clients. Sometimes for certain brands, I have direct relationships with the brand, um, depending on who I know there and if I've worked for them before. And other times it's through, yeah, this is my first time working with Meryl. So through a production company. Um, you know, we get this question a lot from people who are, you know, either switch career changers and are looking to get into filmmaking or people that have even been in filmmaking a while or some of our youth. A lot of times, some of our filmmakers will come to us being, they have a um, topic idea, but not a story idea, right? So it's like, I want to do, I really am passionate about healthcare or I'm passionate about homelessness or social justice. But then there's this anxiety or overwhelmness about, okay, so what story are you actually going to tell about that? Can you tell a little bit about how you go about your storytelling process and finding characters or like narrowing it down from a topic to a real story. Yeah, I always think character first. Um, and even I, in certain projects, people try, even when people try to push me to have a chorus of voices, like that's not my style of filmmaking. I am, I believe that if, if one person experiences it and that experience is very human, everyone will connect with it. And you don't need experts weighing in, you know, if there's something very human about their experience, then the audience will get it. Um, so I really do like those single character stories. And 
it's just, it's, you know, it's the basis of all storytelling of myths of, of stories since forever, you know, there's always like this one person who is doing this one thing, um, or maybe they're just an interesting person and they're not doing anything. Um, but yeah, I always, I always try to find a specific character that embodies or is experiencing th something that speaks to the greater issue. Um, so like, and, and that character could be a lot of people. It could be like, if it was, say you're interested in, let's just take coronavirus because it's happening. Um, you know, you could do the perspective of a healthcare worker. You could do the perspective of the kid of a healthcare worker. You could do an EMT. You could do a doctor in Italy. You know, there's like a million different, but I think I would just think what I'm trying to say and which character am, is experiencing those things the most. Um, yeah, and then and I read the news a lot. News articles help um, because news articles actually do usually lead with very personal stories. If you read the first ha the first few lines of every news article, there it's not like thirty people died today. You know, you'd be like, bye. Right. It's it's usually like Whitney was standing on the platform waiting for her husband. Where could he be? You know, it's and that's good storytelling. So it's it's sort of the same. You always just look for even the news articles have those people. Um, and sometimes you just meet people and they're really weird and doing something interesting. That's happened to me a lot. Um, or they're kind of, they've been in the news, but there's never been a documentary about them. Um, I, I think news journalism is very different than, doc, than films. Um, and I, a lot of people don't want to touch stories that have been done in the news, but I'm, I think it's amazing because you know, news is reporting, but documentary is human and evocative and emotional. So it's it's a completely different twist on a story that may have been told already. Before you kind of transition to fast forwarding to your current state and your current passions with the projects you're doing, I would love to hear a little bit about a story that either really stuck with you or something, you know, you look back at some of your past work and you're like, that's something I'm extremely proud of, or, you know, just something that really you connected with as a creator. That I have made or yeah, that, that, you I've, made. Made. that I've made? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I guess there's a few, I mean, like my, definitely my, let's say like greatest or more, most successful work has been um, my short film, My Dear Kyrgyzstan which was about um, a man in Kyrgyzstan who's transforming his abandoned Soviet mining village into a tourism destination. Um, and so, I, I mean, that's definitely my proudest work because it was super challenging. It's definitely been like the most successful on paper, but it's also, I think it really came out the way that I wanted it to. And it, it was super hard because the character wasn't cooperating with us at all. And we had to like, shift gears again <laughs> common pattern <laughs> um and really lean into who he was but i feel like it's a very authentic film to the character and um i'm very proud of that film because when you're making films in cultures that are outside of your own you can you know it's really easy to want to put yourself into the story or to tell the story from your perspective and i feel like we actually really succeeded and it in it feeling like it was his story um and we did that with you know like incorporating him doing point of view talking into the camera and his instagram footage and funny stuff like that um but it really feels authentically him and i think that was a big lesson if i for future projects on doing stories and cultures outside of my own like if i would love for people to forget that i made it and for it to feel like it's authentically from that place or community Wow, that's amazing. Somebody going to Matt over. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I love that film. Um, how, oh, this is actually a really good question, which I thank you, Matt, for actually typing that because I wanted to bring that up because that's a question that we get asked in almost every single one of our Zoom talks is if you could talk since, you know, you, you definitely do stand a little bit as independent filmmaker. Um, can you talk a little bit about financing or your partnerships and how you go about getting funded? That's a question we always get asked. So thank you. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's changed with time and experience. Um, like my first film running across California was obviously self-financed with my friends, um, rental house cameras, you know, very 
<laughs> Nitty, yeah, gritty. Um, but, uh, I, and then, you know, for My Dear Kyrgyzstan, it was a combination of grants. Um, I partnered with a production company. So when we sold the film, I obviously split the sale with them, but then I would not have split the sale with them if I had not had, you know, I would, I, I was happy to do that because they, they provided a lot of equipment and work in kind, um, which was, a, their name is Documist and they're really amazing if you guys want to check them out. Um, and they are longtime partners of mine, so they helped a lot. And then um, we, I sort of went the, not family, but friends of family route um, and definitely tapped into some of my Bay Area contacts. Um, I've really found it surprising how many t tech people at these bigger tech companies actually mm -hmm. want to invest in film and really want and are willing to kind of do it sometimes just for the credit mm -hmm. and for a pass to a film festival. If you have an extra pass for some of them, especially if they're the bigger festivals. And yeah, that's been really shocking. A lot of people will give you money for an executive producer credit because it feels really nice. And especially if it's on a social issue that they support and want to be associated with. Um, yeah, so that's, that's been a huge, uh, that's been a huge thing that's helped a lot. Um, so that was sort of the combination there. Um, people who were looking for extra credits uh, and have extra money in tech and then um, grants and a partnership with another production company. Yeah, because I definitely know that a lot of our, especially younger or just newer filmmakers get very overwhelmed at the idea of thinking about financing or where to start that process. So it sounds like for you, it's really about just starting conversations with people and like hoping like collaborations form. Yeah, I think you can get pretty far with grants. The problem with grants is they take a really long time to fill out and if you're, new to grant writing, you might not get them for a while. So it can be a little disheartening. Um, but yeah, I try to, I definitely always go the grant route. And then I always, I, I love bringing in other partners. Um, and, you know, you can ask for a lot of favors if it's worthwhile for the people collaborating with you, discounts and whatever. Um, and then, yeah, I, I do like to tap into the tech network <laughs> hey that is a, that's a great network please tap away everybody <laughs> yeah yeah everyone should do it if you know people at google or whatever you'd be surprised um you know that's maybe not yeah high, higher ups are really into the film thing it seems <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> um so you mentioned it earlier and i'm glad we're going to circle back to it now you said uh, at its core, you always eventually wanted to at least get back to some of your passions with social justice or topics around the social, you know, justice communities. How, you know, have you shot any films in, in kind of through a social justice lens? Are you prepping to do those films or topics that you're interested in? If you could just, you know, give us a little bit of that. Yeah, um, I have a few things that I was working on. Some, some of them fell through. Um, I think I'm interested. I don't like the sort of heavy handed um, social issue films. I like doing things that are very nuanced and very human and sort of letting the audience grapple with things. So with My Dear Kyrgyzstan, we sort of hinted at things about globalization. Okay. Um, and then I, I, what, I, I'm working, you know this, I'm on a film um, for about a professional female climber, Beth Rodden, um, who has had an eating disorder and she's been speaking very publicly about it on social media and it's unpacking a lot of body image issues in the climbing community. Um, so that's a bit of an overlap of outdoor stuff and social issue uh, stuff. And then um, my narrative short, is not directly <laughs> a social issue film that I'm directing now, but um, it's about it's about this one time in the third grade that I um, sold glimpses of my hair to boys in exchange for quarters because my mom used to wear make me wear my hair up in a bun every day, and I started taking it down in exchange for quarters. So it's not really a social issue film, but there is fantastic. There's a lot of a lot of stuff in there. Uh, to, to unpack. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's undertones of, you know, male-female dynamics and, and the harshness of growing up um, and being a girl. 
and, and hair politics, which is its own thing. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot in there. So I sort of like, I like human stories and then the things trickle through yeah. in a nuanced way. You know, it's, it's great timing, like, even though we had to postpone your talk to today from last week, but it kind of naturally works with this week because we're having a lot of people come on and talk about narrative filmmaking. And it's oh, interesting right. that you're, you're slowly making that transition. Can you talk to us a little bit about what made you curious to kind of dabble in narrative filmmaking and what this experience has been like, even if you've just started, what it's been like so far to transition? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> It is nice to be able to make stuff up. It is really <laughs> nice. You know, in, in docs, you're always like, ah, and, and it's a beautiful constraint because you have to work with what's real and what you have in the footage. But it's been, it's been really refreshing to just write and make things up. And I'm like, I wish she would say this. And boom, she says it, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> that's been refreshing. But um, yeah, I mean, I really, I, I grew up writing my whole life. Like since I can remember, I was always writing poetry and little stories when I was a kid and whatever. Um, and I, I, yeah, and I somehow forgot that for a while. And one of my mentors, um, who's an executive producer in the Bay Area, Michelle Trenier Saleo, if you guys know her, she long time worked with SF Film. Um, I kept telling her I had all these story ideas and obviously they were all narrative. She was like, you just have to write it. And, and she was like, you have until Friday, you have to write this story, bye. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> but I, I think that was the push that I needed. That was uh, maybe two years ago now. Um, and I actually, I wrote a screenplay that, you know, based on a story that I had told her and then um, yeah, and I've just been writing a lot. So I have a lot of things that are just sitting, but I think the writing helped a lot with the transition because once I realized I could write it, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I can do this. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, and I think you, you know, if you're in doc, you have a visual eye and it's, it's different from narrative in a lot of ways, but it's kind of refreshing for people um, who have worked in uh, scripted for a long time to kind of we're like the wild west, you know? So I think it's fun for them to, <laughs> to work with us. We don't even know we're breaking all these rules that exist, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's been really fun. Um, I like it. It's, I just feel like it's very freeing and it allows you, going back to the social issue thing, mm -hmm. I've noticed in documentary, if you notice the documentaries that get distribution or go to Sundance, they're either social issue documentaries or this is my experience or about famous, celebrities like biopics or yes like huge yeah huge huge market um what's the third category maybe sports you know there's a lot of that um but yeah mostly I feel like it's social issue and famous people and so what do you do if you don't have a social issue that you can think of right now or a lead or um and you don't know any famous people <laughs> um but but my point my it's a little tongue-in-cheek but my point is when you do a social issue doc, it's very polarizing sometimes um, because there's always going to be someone who doesn't agree with the issue or whatever, even no matter how human the character is. Um, but what I've found in narrative to be so liberating is I can, because, you know, you can tell a story that's just about a family. It doesn't have to be about a family who's who are Syrian refugees or whatever, like it could be that, but it could also just be about a family. And then you could start to introduce maybe the boyfriend is a Syrian refugee. Yeah. And you know, and you just weave all these really nuanced things yes. in. That's your jam. Yeah, I love it. Um, and then and then people, I, I think people connect to it um, a bit more, at least from the get-go, because they're sort of um, tricked into paying attention. <laughs> yeah, you're the second filmmaker and like, two weeks that we've had it's it's almost you know we had a um a filmmaker and professor last week that looked at deep diving into documentary filmmaking but said that he had found in his experience one of the best mechanisms for planning those seeds of change is if it is layered in in a nuanced way that it's not aggressively being almost lectured to you and shouted at you it's the nuances that even he has seen in his years of filming and teaching that his audiences have connected more when he's made films with those nuances. So it's interesting totally. to keep bringing that up, but it's yeah. that you can 
start those conversations with people who are watching your film and it doesn't always have to be aggressively thrown at audiences. Yeah, and I also, I, I think, you know, the more complicated your characters, whether it's documentary or narrative, the better. Because, you know, Superman is fun, but I mean, even Superman, he's he's got flaws, right? So it's like, we don't like people who are perfect, they're annoying. So, yeah. <laughs> it's true. true. <laughs> um, and so I think I think those are the most interesting characters. But I think I, I like, I'm very drawn to narrative lately because I like really, um, kind of like everyday stories. I really like suburbia and Americana, um, especially being an immigrant, I'm really fascinated by those things. Um, which is very different from what I do in documentary now, obviously, but I kind of think that every day is really fascinating. Um, and it's harder to convince people to watch a documentary about some guy who owns an ice cream parlor, but for some reason, if it's in a narrative film, we'll do it. <laughs> so true. It'll get, yeah, you'll totally get back to do that. But documentary, it's like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. I don't know. But I, I think that there's something beautiful in the in the everyday and in the simplicity of people's inner psychologies that you can really explore in narrative a bit more. Yeah. Personally, I think that, but yeah. Well, we have a couple questions and I'm going to get to them in just a minute. Um, I'm just going to ask Noam a couple more questions. So if anybody has additional questions to ask, type them in and I'm going to start launching them out here in about five minutes. Um, so please keep typing them. I see a couple. I have not forgotten about you, I promise. Um, I actually, now that you brought it up, I am curious about how or if your background, you know, coming from an immigrant family has shaped the way you tell stories or has influenced the way you see kind of the way your films go. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. I'm, I'm really interested. I, I think it makes me like underdogs a lot. I love story and like really quirky, non-stereotypical heroes. Um, I think I saw a lot of those people growing up and I'm, I'm very interested in highlighting those people. Um, people that are confusingly heroic in a non-heroic sense. Um, I think that's a great really, way to put it. Yeah, I think it's really fun. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a few scripts that are a little more on the nose, immigration based. Um, obviously my short film coming up, you know, things about my hair and stuff are, uh related to that i'm very excited about <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you but yeah I, I think the bottom line is i i'm really fascinated by american culture and it's it's funny because obviously i have an american accent but i, I grew up kind of isolated in some ways um and not fully in american culture mm -hmm. uh despite growing up in america so i i think it's um yeah i've talked to a few immigrant filmmakers about this um and have you have you seen the writer you know that movie no. um esther yeah. has i just saw esther nodding <laughs> now i'm forgetting the name of the director who is a woman do you remember yeah. her name? i don't it starts okay. her last name starts with a z anyway I will look it up while you talk chloe chloe, chloe yeah, yeah chloe something anyway so she um is a chinese immigrant to America and she's her films are basically westerns she's obsessed with the American West oh, and interesting all of her films have actual cowboys playing scripted characters in the American West that's um, fantastic really beautiful and so I think there's something that ha like when you're an immigrant um I don't know if any of you have seen like Chloe Zhao there it is uh Paris Texas you know that was Vim Benders who's German so I think I don't know immigrants seem to be obsessed with America in a, in a way that's really interesting because it allows you to see American culture from this outside perspective and you can sort of analyze it a bit more or maybe I think that motel sign is really beautiful because I don't have that back home but someone else from the U.S. might not look at it um, or notice it so yeah, I'm really interested in exploring like suburbia a bit more um, and di diving into that in my work in the future. No, it's really interesting you said that. Half my family immigrated from Cuba. And so mm -hmm. a lot of my family members, particularly my grandfather, who never really caught on to English as fully, he found a lot of solace in going to McDonald's every day with other immigrants. And it's like so interesting. <laughs> they like love the McDonald's. And just like everything, it was like so American to them. And that was their <laughs> introduction to America, you know? Actually, when I was in college, I did um, this like William Eggleston, who was the, if you guys don't know, he's like this American photographer who just photographed 
everything Americana. So I did this William Eggleston inspired McDonald's photo shoot and I drove across North Carolina photographing different McDonald's. <laughs> so interesting. That's I love funny. it. I really get it. There's something very comforting about those um, certain little nuanced pillars of American culture. <laughs> really funny. Um, I'm going to let you think on this next question while I get to the people who chatted questions, but think about, cause we're going to end on this, like any okay. sort of like, you know, life lessons as a filmmaker you'd want to give to the next generation or any sort of like motivational ending that I'm going to come back to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'll think about it. <laughs> um, but I, we do have a couple questions. One's from one of our youth filmmakers who's been, Riley, thank you. She's been so greatly involved in all of our virtual programmings and other programming. So she always has great questions, but she was just curious, and this is more on the um, in-depth like filmmaking side, how do you go about hiring crew members and at what point in your filmmaking process do you start doing that? That's a really, really good question. I have had many ups and downs in hiring <laughs> crew members. Um, I, I mean, I think it depends which crew members, like number one, I always look for my producer first. Um, yeah, if you, the director producer relationship is the foundation of the film, I think. Um, that's the person that's going to go out to bat for you. It's going to, they're either going to raise money or do the scheduling. There's different types of producers, but first I go for the producer. Um, and always, if I don't know them already, um, recommendations from people and then we have coffee, um, and you know, and then, and then the DP, that's the second most important person to me. Um, and the DP but, is, sorry, the director of photography, the cinematographer, um, those are my two people. And I'm also weirdly very, a very big stickler on music, on score. Interesting. Okay. Um, so that's usually an early hire for me in a oh, weird way. Wow. Yeah, because they're, all of these people determine the style of the film and the emotion of the film. And if they don't get what your film is about and really connect to you on a human level, then it's not going to work. And I think, yeah, that's, you know, there could be the most talented cinematographer in the world who say, who says yes to your project, but you can tell they don't, they don't get it or they don't get you or they don't super care or this is an afterthought for them after they do something bigger. And I don't hire those people. Um, I've tried and they will disappoint you a million <laughs> times, no matter how famous they are. You like, I would rather hire a less experienced person who will make my project their universe and is so excited and wants to send me screenshots of colors at 1 a.m. You know, that's yeah. The yeah. See, that, I love that. I love that you said that because I think, um, not that I know anyone personally that does this, but I'm pretty sure just culturally big names and, you know, award winner and big names. It's like, of course, like I'll do anything to get this person. But if they're not equally as excited or invested, you're not going to get that kind of support. I'm sure that's just my assumption at this point. Yeah, and I think that I, I actually had this earlier on in my career where actually like famous-ish people or more experienced people were saying yes to me and I really wanted to work with them, but to, to, to you, they are everything and to them, you are like a little blip in their larger project matrix and you just don't want that. You want someone who is obsessed with your story and gets your script or your topic or whatever um, yeah, I, I want the people who want to talk to me at 2 a.m., not because I'm calling them necessarily, I'm not that mean, but because they're, like, so excited, and you can feel that in a conversation, you know, when I, when I interview DPs or, um, talk to them, I, I first ask them, like, what are you guys, what do you think, what do you think about the script, and I wait to see if they're gonna go off on this tangent rant and, say, oh, and in this scene, and yes, and I, this reminded me when I was five, and whatever, you know, that's, you're like, okay, they get it. Um, that was awesome, and then Riley said, thank you, that was really helpful. Uh, <laughs> so if there's any last questions, get them in, because we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Noam's been so great with her time, um, but I, there was somebody that submitted a question to me privately, just wasn't in the main chat, but they said, who or what was her biggest inspiration that led you into this line of work? Wow. That, that, is was, from, that was from John. <laughs> that is a tough question. Um, it's funny. I think my earlier inspirations are no longer my inspirations. 
um, which is which is funny. But uh, yeah, I was really, I I I was really obsessed with Jimmy Chin long before Free Solo. I watched Meru and all these other films that he had made when no one really knew about him as a cinematographer yeah. or photographer. So, um, and he made Free Solo um, recently. So yeah, I think that was a huge inspiration for me just to see that it was possible. Um, but I, I think lately I've been really inspired by, um, I mean, I have like favorite directors and stuff, but in terms of like inspiration, I think Alma Harrell is really inspiring. She did Honey Boy. Yeah. Kyle LaBeouf last year. She's just a pick yourself up from your bootstraps and, but not even like beautiful collaborative and pick other people up and, and don't give up and fight. Even if you're, it takes you three decades to get your movie to Sundance. And those are the people that really inspire me now. People who are, get rejections every day and just push until they make it. I think that's going to be my life. So you know what? <laughs> inspired I, by them. <laughs> but that's the fighting spirit. And like you said, I mean, you said it at some point during our talk, this hour long talk, which has been so great. And I always say this, but I could talk to you forever. No, we are always yeah. so charismatic and just so open with our <laughs> life. <Likewise, laughs> yeah. um, but it's not easy. Like you said, it's filmmaking is not for the faint of heart. Like, you have to be yeah. so like when you said you finally decided to commit yourself to this path, you knew you were like, this is not, this is not an easy path, but I, I, I want it. Yeah. I get rejected from something at least once a day. Um, yeah, less so with COVID-19, but, <laughs> but, but usually like it's either a grant or a film festival or someone who doesn't want to work with me because the timing doesn't align or they don't like my work, whatever. I really get a rejection a day on average. And so you just kind of have to stop taking it personally. Um, but to listen, sometimes it's helpful. <laughs> Which leads me, oh wait, let's see. Oh, oh, one more I, was gonna, I was just gonna be like, let me drop that huge question on you, but um, let me see. Oh, I was talking about Blackfish and that a woman directed it, um, I think kind of, is that, is that a film that you've seen? Like, is that kind of like the activism, social justice avenue that you would want to work in or is that not really? No, <laughs> but I love Blackfish. Blackfish is a great movie. Blackfish is what I would consider um, early days of documentary filmmaking. It's okay. kind of that man on wire, black, not early days, people have been making documentaries forever, but like. Um, <laughs> but I think like, that's kind of when they seem to, People Early like, days of the transition that we're seeing today. Yeah, and right. I feel like just connecting with more wider audience. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's always been people that are interested in documentary film, but now it's like- Yeah, I, yeah, I, there's sort of blockbuster documentary film. Yes, blockbuster documentary. Oh, Everybody has seen it. Yeah. Blackfish, Searching for Sugar Man, um, Man on the Wire. It's that same era of um, Oscar-winning documentaries. Documentaries on the map. And also yes. transitioning us from talking head, like- interview yes. experts to more like drama action um people yeah, like laugh. very cinematic like the cove i remember the music was just so like it was crazy it felt like star wars level music in that documentary yeah yeah and actually on that note um on the i don't i don't know if a woman directed blackfish i guess i i don't remember the director but mm -hmm. um uh, there there is actually higher gender parody in documentary film in terms of recognition um and getting director spots and stuff like that than a narrative so it's interesting thank you for bringing that up <laughs> <laughs> I am. but as we kind of wrap these last few questions Noam it would be great to hear some inspirational notes either from things that you've learned along the way you already started with it which is like you get rejected every day and you just got to keep having a fighting spirit but it would be great like you know, was there a lesson that stood out to you either in, you know, a big triumphant moment or it was a hard lesson to take or anything that you really want filmmakers who are just starting this journey to kind of know about the journey? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the only thing that's kept me going, uh, the only thing that sounds depressing, um, but one of the main things that's kept me going is I have a really, really close group of filmmaker friends um, that I talk to all the time. I talk to at least one friend in the filmmaking community probably every day. And we're like, and there's different different pods of people for different things. I have my documentary friends, I have my narrative friends, I have my festival friends, you know, there's different <laughs> types. But I, and I send them my work. We send each other like rough cuts and drafts of screenplays and they'll tell you it's great or it's bad or whatever. Um, and you can just commiserate about the same things. and 
and yeah, they're, they're just a wealth of inspiration telling me what movies to watch and just making me feel really loved. So get yourself a good group of filmmaker friends. Community. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no. where can people check your workout, follow you? Like, is there films that people can watch online? You know, since we're quarantining and sheltering, where can people check out <laughs> some of the stuff you've created? Um, most of my work's on my website, um, which links, I'll drop the link. In yeah, the drop the link. It, I think it links to other places on the internet. But um, yeah, that's my website. Most of my work's on there. Uh, my Instagram is my name, followed by the number 12. Um, so you can follow me on there. And yeah, I'm, I'm very, I say this on everything, but it's true. I am weirdly responsive to strangers who reach out <laughs> just because I'm a big fan of the cold email. So if you cold email me, I will talk to you for sure. Um, that is amazing. Stranger. <laughs> is there anything else you want to add or anything you think I missed in asking you? We have just like two more minutes left. I want to make sure you felt. Um, the only thing is, to I'm moving to New York in August, so I'm leaving the Bay Area. <laughs> no! Did you get into grad school? Yeah, I did get into grad school, so I'm going to NYU Tisch for my MFA if they let people move to New York. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's um, incredible. Congratulations. Yeah, really. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super excited. So I'm sad to be leaving the Bay Area community, obviously. But that's incredible. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, more, more scripted films to come. Soon. Okay, so like, <laughs> okay, going that route. That's so exciting. Okay, so then we definitely need to follow you as you transition out of the Bay Area then. So everybody- Yeah, keep in touch know. though. I'm only a plane, plane ride away. <laughs> We're almost still just having you join us virtually. You're not right, gonna, yeah. I'm gonna still be like, no, come join us. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. You are absolutely amazing. Anybody that if you think of a question later, you can, like Noam said, you can either reach out to her directly or reach out to us at Real Yeah, Stars. and there's a lot of nuances to the financing stuff that I'm happy to talk people through. It's just hard to explain in a Q&A, but if you have specific questions, I can answer those.